You three criminals have been caught in a further act of seditious treason. Your only feeling was contempt for our society. Your only desire was to command. This council has no hesitation in proclaiming you all guilty. 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 Welcome to Phantom Zone, uh, the podcast where we dredge the lakes of hell in search of the worst uh, that cinema has to offer and put it on trial for its sins against humanity. Uh, should a film be found guilty, we're going to jettison it into the far, far reaches of space, a phantom zone, if you will, where it won't be a danger for future generations. Um, this week on the docket, we have Loose Cannons, uh, the 1990, um, I guess you could call it a comedy, uh, starring um, Gene Hackman and uh, Dan Aykroyd. Um, joining me, I am your host, of course, Adrian Torres, and joining me is Scott Daly. Hey, Adrian, how's it going? Good. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing great. Um, I'm, I would be doing better if you didn't make me watch this terrible, terrible movie and then make me talk about technically, it for an hour. Technically, I'm, I'm going to go on record here and say that I did offer up a list of movies to choose, and, and this is the one that was settled on this time. Okay, yeah, but when you tell me it's a movie with Dan Aykroyd and Gene Hackman in it, I kind of assume that it has a certain level of quality. Well, that, now we know otherwise. Um, <laughs> Also joining us is Matt Freeman. How you doing, everybody? Good. How did yeah, this, uh, you you didn't like it, or did you like it? Well, it was certainly educational. I, I learned <laughs> that um, that very talented individuals can come together and put a lot of effort into something, and that thing can be utterly horrible. <laughs> so, um. And just like Scott said, you, you when you hear Gene Hackman and Dan Aykroyd, you have a certain expectation, and it's it's liberating in a way to see how uh, how wrong you are. <laughs> Guys, it's, just, it's very very true. I just have to give you a warning. Sometimes when I'm podcasting, um, I get really stressed out, and then I just start acting in all kinds of different pop culture references from the '80s. Um, so I just want to just want to make sure you guys are aware of that. If I start randomly quoting Star Trek. Um, that's what's going on. Would you call them personalities, Scott? I, I would. I would. I mean, <laughs> very, very <laughs> loosely, I would call them personalities. We we are we are getting uh, ahead of ourselves. Um, <laughs> to to give you a a brief synopsis of what this movie is about, uh, Gene Hackman is a supposedly off his edge, wild, fly by the seat of his pants um, police officer. Um, who was a detective and got demoted down um, basically to a lower crime beat. Um, and he's moved back up to homicide to uh, solve a series of murders that are taking place in Washington, D.C. Uh, you know it's Washington, D.C. because there's maybe two to three seconds in the film where Gene Hackman is not wearing his uh, hideous Washington Redskins jacket. Um, and he is paired up with uh, Dan Aykroyd's um, very keen and brilliant observer who, when violence is um, in front of him in his general direction, or basically if somebody farts near him, uh, he ends up getting riled up and uh, suffers a uh, trance-like state in which he... Um, they, they say that it's a multiple personality disorder, but it's basically just as, as Scott mentioned a moment ago, it's it's him saying different pop culture lines, maybe doing a character here and there, but it's more so just doing famous little tidbits and pieces of some decisions that make sense and some that that don't. But I don't I, I don't I don't know how to mention it. Uh, the film actually has a very interesting background. Um, originally, the. The script was written by Richard Matheson, um, who did The Last Man on Earth and a whole bunch of other stories that were turned into to movies and a very famous fiction author. Um, and he wrote the script for the movie with his son, R.C., uh, over the course of a year. 
year. Uh, originally, the film was called Face Off uh, because the villain of the film was uh, a psychotic hockey player. Um, they sold it to uh, a studio, basically pitching it as a sequel to Cobra. And Sylvester Stallone was attached for a period of time until he thought it was a horrible idea and dropped out. Um, the script then ended up getting shifted over to uh, CAA, a very big, famous um, agency through the, the 80s and 90s for lots of top build actors. Um, and it was reconfigured for um, Hackman and Aykroyd, who were clients at the time, as a type of uh, lethal weapon film. Um, when it got to them, it was uh, given to Bob Clark as uh, director. Bob Clark famously did uh, Christmas Story, Porky's, um, Black Christmas, and a whole bunch of other movies. Uh, when he got a hold of it, for whatever reason, he decided that he wanted to rewrite the entire film and had Dan Aykroyd um, help him out with it. Um, and it is terrible, for <laughs> lack of a better word. <laughs> That, that's a very good summary of the, the weird history of this film. I love, I love that in the 80s, naming a movie Face Off was because, um, because it had to do with hockey. And in the 90s, naming, naming a movie Face Off is because someone literally takes their face off. I like, that's, a, that's, a great, that's a great comparison in the differences between the two <laughs> decades. Know, cultural shift. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, speaking of the scripts, um, this is nominally a, a comedy. There's not a... F- funny line in it as far as i can tell which is pretty impressive considering the actors like you would think that the actors could at least make something come off as funny even if it wasn't but uh nope and it's not for lack of trying they seem like they're trying very hard to be funny they're just not like even happen oh yeah 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 Every, everybody's trying hard. Everybody's falling on their face. Um, lots of times that they try to go for a joke, it either falls flat or comes off as uh, really off-putting and awkward. Uh, part of that, I think, is because the film was actually shot in 1988, uh, but the studio decided that they didn't want to release it until 1990. So, of course, they, they updated all the jokes that specifically referenced the 80s, right? No, no, no. They, they, I mean, one of the, uh, to, to jump right into it, it, the very first thing that you see on the screen, of course, is your, your opening titles uh, telling you who's made the film. And the production company, well, one of the main executive producers of this film was none other than Aaron Spelling. And when you see that name pop up on the screen, it doesn't exactly uh, put a whole bunch of confidence into you. <laughs> no, no, it does not. Um, and when it goes straight from, um, Aaron Spelling to a very, very foggy shot of what look like lights or lanterns or torches in the distance. And you hear a few people, uh, mumbling, um, whispering, uh, cause, cause we start in, in media res, but with what's going on is never really explained to you. Cause, uh, you have, uh, um, a speedboat. The second shot that you see, besides this fog and Aaron Spelling's name, is Dom DeLuise, um, which again is not something that gives you a whole lot of confidence. Um, oh, come on, <laughs> don't, for, don't for, be for, mean to poor Tom. For, Dom DeLuise plays Dom DeLuise in the movie. He's not. He. It looks like somebody stole him from an afternoon off Hollywood Squares and just handed him pages of a script. Yeah, that's that's actually probably scarily accurate. Is this <laughs> is this the worst opening in the history of film? Because <laughs> this opening I, I, I think is so. really bad. Like, and you can kind of see what they're trying to do, right? They're trying to um, they're trying to do this in media res thing where you see this crime occur, and then we flash forward to the detectives later in the movie trying to solve the crime that we've just witnessed. But it's so. It's so weirdly shot. It's so weirdly done. None, none of it makes sense. All these characters are wearing costumes for inexplicable reasons. I mean, I, I read the synopsis before I watched this movie, so I was honestly thinking that this boat with these strangely dressed characters on it was some sort of like manifestation of Dan Aykroyd's multiple personality <laughs> disorder. Um, and I think that would have made way yeah. more sense than what what we actually saw. 
Yeah, that, that's funny. I actually liked the beginning more before the rest of the movie kind of happened because I assumed it was some sort of weird Lynchian vision, like very stylistic. And then I realized, no, that was just a lot of really terrible decisions in terms of filming something in an impenetrable fog um, and then having a nonsensical action scene. So, and, having, uh, and having someone yeah. scream the word Steckler 500 times <laughs> in five minutes of, yeah. of movie scene. Well, yeah. in, in the middle of that, uh, in this bank of fog, you've got one small little uh, speedboat that you're like the size that you normally see if you go to a lake for the weekend. And then you've got what looks like a more high powered uh, speedboat slash mini yacht. And on the front of it, you can kind of make out a figure who's who's talking to the smaller speedboat half of which you can't understand what he's saying because it, it feels like his head's turned to the left of wherever the mic is to the right. And the first thing that you can really hear him say is, uh, we, we thought he was going to kill you, so we killed him instead, which directly cuts to a fishing pole that he's holding in his hand, a close-up to the end of the fishing line, which just happens to casually have a decapitated head. Directly after you see the decapitated head, it cuts to the smaller speedboat where Dom DeLuise and his friends are, and they start comically screaming, basically, just going, ah, oh my god, no! Yeah, all those characters were really weird, and we don't see basically any of them ever again, except for Dom DeLuise, but... Like they're all like it really felt like it's it was it's so surreal, right? And that's what made me think, and I think what Matt think that it was some sort of surrealist kind of scene. But no, this is just how the movie's starting, and nothing else matches the tone of this opening scene for the rest of the film at all. Yeah, and they they have a chase scene that looks like it it was shot on, on uh, uh, the Universal Studios Jaws ride is, is the best way to describe it because it just <laughs> looks cheap and dingy, and it's the only reason. And I can think of that they have that much fog for half of it because all of a sudden, once they uh, drive the speedboat onto land, they uh, there's no fog directly after that. All the fog has lifted magically. Um, one of the people who was in the boat gets caught in a, in a net, and all the bad guys conveniently just run past him, just like oh, that, that guy's doomed. He's caught in a net. We don't need to worry about him. Well, so um, the, the weird thing about this, they've established at the beginning of the scene that. Um, they're not, they don't want to hurt him because obviously he, kn or we find later that he knows something or has some information that they need, but they just like open fire on these guys and like shoot wi wildly and blindly and kill like half of them. So it's, it's just very confusing. It's like, we want to protect you so we can get information from you, but we don't also are just going to wildly try to kill you constantly. And and it's not like they're trying to detain him or anything. They just, they just casually walk by and they're like ah oh, we, we might come back for you but we know who you are so so don't worry about that um and we cut directly from that and the movie is just full of horrible edits and just jump cuts but just in in the middle of all this is going on it just jumps all of a sudden um to gene hackman with a very very young david allen greer um I, I guess in a scene that's supposed to show how crazy he is because the scene ends with David Allen Greer saying, they told you you or told, told me you was crazy. Uh, but nothing that he does in the scene actually shows that he's a loose cannon or crazy at all. <laughs> you mean asking people to stop having sex until they get condoms and making up laws that says sex in the 80s without condoms in Washington, D.C. Is, is illegal? That's not crazy well, enough for you? No, it's not. It's not crazy because he's a police officer and people said that they've called many times. And so they can at least cite them with a noise complaint. And if it's something that's happened several different times, then he can arrest him. Right. Yeah. He, Go ahead. He's just kind of a cantankerous guy. Like he, he there's no evidence that he would be. Um, I don't know. The, the movie doesn't correctly characterize him as anything like a loose cannon, as you say. No. No, th no. I mean, this is it. This is supposed to be his establishing scene, right? The goal of the scene is to show how nuts and crazy he is, and it it fails completely. It it fails because then we directly jump uh, into um, a night scene outside, or I, it looks like it's across the block, basically, with the way it's edited to the police station, um, where he is talking to uh, Westgate. Um, 
a a pol- another fellow police officer that you think is think is going to kind of be a foil, maybe have something to do later in the film because he shows nope. up in like the first three scenes of the movie and then is just gone, and he's only there so he can have a really weird car metaphor talk uh, <laughs> with Gene Hackman, who is waxing his car at night. The car first. First of all, is completely empty. There's nothing in the back seat. There's nothing strapped to the top of the car whatsoever. And to give you a visual of this car, the best thing that I can describe it as is the Muppet Mobile from the Muppet movie, the original <laughs> Muppet movie from way it, back in the I way that is. Fozzie drives. Yeah, that, that's exactly what it looks like. Um, and the scene serves no purpose except for to confuse the hell out of you because the next direct scene uh, that we see Gene Hackman is has him sleeping in the front of his car. There is a whole bunch of random objects and household appliances and clothes and everything thrown in the back of his vehicle, a cat in a carrier, a bicycle and a whole bunch of other things strapped to the top of the car. And there is no true explanation as to what happened in the intervening hours from that evening to that morning that caused him to put all this stuff on his car. Adrian, he doesn't have a house anymore because he's a loose cannon. So the cannon is so loose that he doesn't even have a house. (laughs) He says when he he shows up to a crime scene the next morning that he had to leave his apartment early because there was a fire in it. Directly five minutes after that, somebody makes the the comment that he doesn't live anywhere and hasn't lived anywhere for years. And then halfway through the movie, um, I don't know if he's a police chief or captain or whatever, makes the comment, I know that you've got a troubling home situation right now. So you can say with this other guy, even though they've established that he's been divorced from his ex-wife for a long period of time. This this is an example of, of a running theme through this movie of extremely troublesome and worrying stuff that's kind of thrown to the outside of the movie and never really talked about and focused on or just treated like a joke when it it should be really probably examined as like you feel bad for these characters like they're supposed to be funny crazy characters ah, ha, ha, but this i feel bad for this guy yeah, the, the, there there are so many instances in this movie where they drop a little line, which in, in a normal movie would be like the lead into an emotional arc for this character. Like, oh, what's happening with his house situation? He's having live in his car. OK, well, this is this is going to obviously be central to understanding where this character is coming from and why he is the way he is and possibly tie into his catharsis in some way. But in this movie, it's just like a random element from draft four of the script that that didn't get didn't get deleted i guess or or maybe part of it did i guess the scene explaining it got deleted <laughs> i don't well G- gene hackman's character doesn't really have an arc he doesn't have a story in this he doesn't go through any kind of fundamental change he doesn't do anything um you can see where they're kind of trying to cut co- like there's so much lethal weapon copying throughout this movie and you can kind of see what they're trying to do um, but but Hackman's character just has nothing to do really at all in this film. No, and, and I mean Ackroyd's not not much better because no. we get this this wonderful opening with Hackman, and then we meet Dan Ackroyd, who is uh, at a a Bez- uh, Benedictine uh, monastery somewhere in Washington D.C. or Connecticut which I, I don't know where the nearest one is, but apparently it's within enough distance that he can make it to a crime scene within like 30 minutes or so. Um, and he's seen um, painting uh, a, a, a picture while talking to another uh, monk who is supposed to be his, his psychiatrist, apparently. He, he's seen miming painting a picture because <laughs> this movie is so half-assed that you can clearly see that his paintbrush is dry and they do his, a close-up extreme close-up shot on him painting and you can see the brush is dry and you can see that none of his strokes are actually putting any paint on the canvas at all why would you include the scene in the movie i mean this is like this is not a funny movie it's not a well-written movie but it is lazily edited and directed like so much so like i'm not saying that you could take this script and turn it into a good movie but you could try like the, the direction in this is just terrible Yes. I mean that that that's putting it mildly, I think. <laughs> but talk about talk about the 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 murder scene when we first we we get an idea of who Dan Aykroyd's character is, um, but we don't really see 
him in full swing until we get to that that murder scene with the most awkward transition ever <laughs> well the I, I love the beginning of the murder scene and you can actually find um the, the very start of this scene um on on youtube um i think we can put a, a link in the show notes because it's worth seeing from the visual imagery because <laughs> it starts out on a shot of this field uh where you see part of a police officer and then emerging from the weeds is Gene Hackman, who's brought his cat with him. The cat that he has for part of the scene, but you don't see really where the cat goes, uh, is just having a, a genuine kind of lackadaisical conversation uh, with the police uh, commissioner, or chief, whatever he is. Um, it, it's very low key is the best way to describe it as they happen to pass um, uh, a dead body whose head is has been decapitated again. God damn it, it's hot. It must be 110 out here. Hey, Mac. How you been? Hey, remember the Cam move? Yeah. Uh, How's Claire? Cal, huh? Claire? Claire's a born-again Christian. Nah, go on. She's a Catholic. Yeah, every time I go over to see my son, calls me the Antichrist and hides under the bed. Oh, <laughs> come here. What's going on here? Oh. <laughs> Well, you got there, Stern. About this? This is a cat. Can I track the killers with it? Oh, Most people use dogs. Come on, Wesker. <laughs> we know it's a cat. It's really funny, Wesker. <laughs> I had a fire in my apartment this morning. I, I, I didn't want to leave it in the car, so I... What do you got here? Male Caucasian. Teeth extracted. Fingerprint zapped. And over here's where they pulled the boat in to dump the body. Must have been a pretty big boat from the side. But yeah, it's it's crazy how that music is playing at the beginning. It's this this really weird, chill, relaxed music over this scene where Gene Hackman is stumbling through a swamp with a cat, and then and then finds a, a decapitated body, and that's just we play that as as not traumatic or anything, just totally normal and kind of funny. There's like the tone, like the tonal whiplash in this film, or it's not even whiplash because it's stuff that should be tonally dramatic is not treated as such at all. The, the the film has no idea what it's trying to do or what it's trying to get across. It, it, you can't even really say that it's a tonal mishmash because the movie doesn't know what it wants to be at any uh, point. It, it's not really playing fast and loose because it doesn't even care about those concepts. It's just kind of... Uh, it's workmanlike in a very weird way where it's basically, we need to get done with the scene, move on to the next scene. Let, let's just get it done. Who cares? Did we get the shot? Okay, on to the next bit. Yeah. So the whole point of this scene, though, is that that Dan Aykroyd's character shows up. Who I can't. What's his name? Do you remember his name? I can't remember. Ellis. Ellis. Yeah. There you go. Yes. Um. He shows up and he, in his really weird way, immediately solves the case. Or well, at least he breaks down the scene in what's supposed to be a super impressive way. Um. But just comes off like really obnoxious. Like Dan Aykroyd. I think he's a good actor. His acting in this movie is atrocious. And like. The, the scene where he like walks up and goes to shake Gene Hackman's character's hand and then like has to throw up again and runs off in the corner. Like that's, that's terrible. That's awful. Yes. Well, the, the funny thing about the way that um, Dan Aykroyd plays uh, the, the scene is that it, if you were to think of like a horrible um, a sitcom writer or director, like I'll just throw out something like uh, Dharma and Greg. If you were to take whoever was the showrunner for Dharma and Greg and say, hey, we're going to have you take over the next season of Stephen Moffat's uh, Sherlock. And we want you to take that um, deft uh velvety touch that you brought to dharma and greg and, and bring it to <laughs> to this this great deductive mind and, and that's essentially how how the this scene plays out because he is brilliant and he's making these deductions but you just don't really care about anything that he's saying and the movie also feels the same way because um dan Aykroyd goes through explains the whole situation and then stops and uh and says is there any questions? And Gene Hackman goes, yeah, sure. Um, I've got six of them. Then lays out very monotonely the six questions that he has. And Dan Aykroyd step-by-step step answers each and every single one of his questions, going even into further detail 
from what we already heard. So a scene that should normally be maybe two to three minutes ends up going on for about nine to ten minutes. And I'm going to be honest, he didn't do any great detective work here. No, right. He reminds me of of the character Adrian Monk, but without any of the charm or fun. (laughs) Yeah, it's I like think... that's what that that's what they're going for. They're going for the Sherlock Holmes thing where he's a detective genius, but they don't really know how to do it. They're just aping the conventions of how that's done by showing him do something which seems really unlikely. Yeah, and, and then and then when Gene Hackman points out that it doesn't make any sense, it 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 just makes the scene drag on and on. Well, and it only doesn't make any sense because he intentionally withheld additional information, like. He's like, oh, I knew it was a person dressed as the Queen of Hearts because there's this giant piece of fabric, like the biggest ripped piece of fabric you will ever see. Like a lot of times, like in these CSI shows, they have like little fabric pieces or a little tiny square. But this is like the size of a a head, a human head piece of fabric with a giant (laughs) Queen of Hearts costume on it. So it's like, no shit. You knew the person was wearing a Queen of Hearts costume and he jumped a fence. You found a giant piece of fabric on the fence. Like, it's, God, it's so terrible. And you, you'd think that this would, um, you'd think they'd find a lead and then the scene would jump to them directly on the chase, you know, ready to go, trying to trying to um, pick up where things are going to go next. But instead they go to a meandering, almost five minute car scene uh, where these two characters are supposed to get to know each other uh, a little bit more. And there's not really any reason for it whatsoever except for to really try the patience of the audience 15 minutes into the film yeah like so this scene serves no purpose except for that we know the person that was at the scene of the crime is a big fat guy right i mean that's literally the only piece of evidence they get that links to dom de Luise's character later in the film from that scene is that he's big um and i, I like what you said about the 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 car scene because it almost seems like the people that wrote this this movie took like the skeleton of what a buddy cop movie is, and they say, okay, you mm-hmm. you introduce this character and he has his flaw. You introduce this character and he has his flaw. You have them come together on a case, and then you have them do their first ride together and learn about each other. And they just went down the list and checked off each of these items, but they didn't ever take the time to like know what to do to fill in the skeleton with anything remotely yeah. good or funny. Or like if you're trying to do a comedy riff on the buddy cop movies i could see that especially with how popular lethal lethal weapon was like i can see that as something you're going for but a it has to be funny and b it has to understand what is good about buddy cop films in the first place and this film does neither of those things well i I think go ahead the the movie the the other guys is that the one with mark Wahlberg and and will ferrell yes yes yeah well i mean that movie clearly has this scene analyzed log in it where it's just the two characters like raking each other and and they even have like oh this is the uptight guy and this is the more loose cannon character (laughs) um but uh but it's super funny and and like you're really into it in that movie because they do it correctly and and it it, i mean that movie just highlights everywhere this movie falls down honestly yeah you're absolutely right you you also get the feeling that there's setting up something that that the next scene um, is going to be it, in, throughout the movie. You're feeling, oh, this next scene, um, th- this is going to be perfect. This is going to get them uh, a chance to get back on their feet, um, to go down the line because we've seen elements of this in other buddy cop movies. This is where gonna it's, it's going to fit together. And the next scene is one of those classic setups where they end up going to. Um, I guess you could call it an S and M club because it kind of looks like an S M S and M club kind of looks maybe like an eighties gay club also happens to have some weird kiss stripper cosplay going on in the background as well, for whatever reason, it, um, it looks like one someone, of the weirder things that I've seen. So yeah, it looks like someone who doesn't know anything about S and M, what they would design when they think of an S and M club. That's really what it looks like. It, it's, it, it's really funny. It's, it, it's clearly, it, it's clearly out of that, uh, 80s uh, sensibility of taking two very straight edge normal um, characters and putting them in a situation um, where they're going to have to go outside their their comfort zone. Um, that's not really the case here. 
whatsoever. No one's asked to do anything. And the film doesn't make it a ton of sense. I mean, they're trying to find a way to naturally bring uh, Dom DeLuise back into the movie, um, whose nickname is the hippo. Um, as they tell us like 10 or 12 different times for no real use whatsoever. Um, but, but they need to bring him back into the story. So they just decide to have the club scene. You think that it's going to be wild and crazy and fun, but not really. Usually um, in any of these buddy cop films or uh, movies where they, they have the scene where they're in the club, there's usually um, some type of misunderstanding or disagreement, uh, differing of views. Um, in this one, all it is is Gene Hackman sees Dom DeLuise on the other side of the room, yells that he needs to talk to Dom DeLuise, starts to push between two to three people, and then bitch slaps a guy so that he can get to Dom DeLuise, which is what starts a fight in the bar. Yeah, and Dom DeLuise looks like he gets up to run away, but then he just, like, stays... <laughs> in the bar <laughs> he just stays behind a door looking through the window seeing what's happening um but the important part of the yeah. scene is our our dramatic turn right our turn our reveal of dan Aykroyd's problem if, if you if you want to call it that um th- there's not really anything dramatic or revealing about it it's it's again just more trying of the audience's patience uh, because they give a very loose definition of that anytime there's uh, violence or, I guess, agitation or indigestion um, around Dan Aykroyd, he falls into, I guess, I guess it would be a trance because sometimes he blacks out. Sometimes he's aware of what's going on. Other times he's not. But he ends up supposedly having personalities uh, that come out, um, depending upon what the the situation is. Um, some some of them I, are I, his I, own characters, right? Some are his own made up characters, and then I because <laughs> there's definitely a British man. He starts doing a British accent that I don't think was a pop culture reference, but then he does a bunch of pop culture references. But then he falls back to his British man once or twice. Is this is yeah. this the most insensitive depiction of a mental disorder in the history of film? I think it might but, be. It's one of them. Um, uh, off, off the top of my head, the the movie that I go back to <laughs> uh, this year that I would probably put up with loose cannons, at least with its uh, dep- depiction of somebody with a mental illness, is the Kevin Costner film Criminal. No, I didn't see that one. <laughs> uh, but I'll take your word for it. Well, th- they mentioned early on in that movie that uh, he doesn't have any empathy and that he, you know, he acts, he doesn't have a filter or anything. Um, and later on in the movie, they reveal basically that he has a uh, developmental disorder um, that affected him when he was about five to seven years old. Um, so his brain is basically permanently stunted in that five to seven year old uh, state, even though he's a grown adult. Um, so you've got lots of points in the movie where he's reacting a way that um, an insolent child might, but the audience is laughing at it when you're like, no, 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 this guy's severely disturbed and he has a mental disability. He's not a hard ass or anything like this is really fucked up. And it's it's along the same lines in this movie where it's uh, we'll get to the reason why it's extremely messed up. But um, uh it, it it yes, Scott. It is completely insensitive and and makes no sense why they decided to go this direction. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't like. I don't get it. Like, here's the, here's the thing. Again, this is trying to be a buddy cop comedy, right? It's not funny. What he's doing isn't funny. Most of the impressions no. are not good, and it's not funny. Um, it, it has nothing to do with the overall story. It. it you could call this part of Dan Aykroyd's arc in the film is him learning to overcome this, this issue he has, but that that, we'll get to that a little later, but that doesn't really ever happen either. Um, It's, it it, it makes no sense. And I, I I almost feel like there was an original version of this film. um, Maybe after it became after the hockey film treatment, but where he actually did have a somewhat accurate depiction of what multiple personality disorder actually is. A disorder that's extremely rare and almost never depicted right in film. But yeah. um, at least a more 
common depicted version of that, which is that he transforms into different characters to deal with different situations. Um, and then, and then I just feel like you said Dan Racco had got a pass on this. I just feel like he went in and said, I want to do a, a Kirk impression. I want to do a Woody Woodpecker impression. I want to do a Wizard of Oz impression. And he just wrote all this shit in, in, and it makes no sense. It makes absolutely no sense. It doesn't even make sense yeah. in the context of the scene in which it's happening. Like not, not to mention the context of the entire movie. I, I'm just going to keep bringing in uh, the other guys because it's just a great way of showing how bad this movie is. Um, that, that, that uh, Will Ferrell's character is like his quirk is that he's like a forensic accountant basically. And he's <laughs> super nerdy about it. And of course the resolution of the movie comes in that like his skill at being a forensic accountant is super relevant and useful. So it's not just, it's not just completely irrelevant to everything like this is. And, and of course, in contrast in this movie, his quirk is that he has multiple personality disorder, which does not cleverly figure into the resolution in any real way, other than that. He's just speaking in weird voices the whole time. Well, and neither does his but, Sherlock Holmes tendency to be super good detective guy either. Like neither of those things help solve the case at all. Like, no. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, it seems like Gene, Gene Hackman's character is actually doing all the legwork. At least that was my impression. I, I don't know. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. For for all for the most part, I mean, the, the Dan Aykroyd is giving little breadcrumbs that Gene Hackman um, is is putting together. But then at the same time, they're they're just kind of stumbling into literally everything that happens. They end up getting a hold of Dom DeLuise finally at the resolution. Um. Uh, of the scene and then that leads directly into a car chase from people who are like oh crap they got dom de louise i guess we got to go after them to get dom de louise like it, it, lots of the events that happen in the movie is is happenstance like these people happen to be in the same place as these people who are looking for um the the other per- who are looking for dom de louise and they're looking for dom de louise because of something that he's trying to purchase and was trying to get his hands on uh, with one of the guys from uh, the beginning of the film. But instead of really having it easily explained, you get it explained in pieces from two different groups of people. Uh, You have a group of um, a a couple Russian guys. um, I don't I don't know if they're in Washington, D.C. or in Russia. They didn't really make it clear and I didn't really care to to go back and find out. Um, But we're introduced to Robert Prosky's character, uh, who most people will know as uh, the guy who was in toy in charge of the toy store in um, Home Alone 2. Uh, He's been in a whole bunch of stuff, (laughs) but um, a lot lots of lots of people that. Lots of people who are younger and probably in our our, our audience A train will will we'll know him from that. Um, and we we're introduced to him. He's only got like three scenes in the movie, um, but he's a high profile character because of his, uh, I, I guess, his connection, tangential connection to things that are going on. But he never really has a direct hand in anything that happens. But they want you to know that he's supposed to be important because. Um, he's a Russian character who's going to be put into um, a, a, a big political position for for New Russia, basically. Well, isn't he and supposed to be he, the, the chancellor of West Germany? I thought that's what. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. But, but it's one of those that that they that they, they have future plans to maneuver him into being. Uh, like, like the head of uh, a, a unified Russia for the future, because I mean, this is this is being made in 1988. The movie comes out in in 1990, so they're they're trying to uh, think of that positive future. But you're not really given a ton of information. All you really have to go off of is the fact that he has uh, a giant, hideous uh, birthmark underneath his eye. That for uh, audience is who are seeing the movie at the time who are in their i'm guessing mid 20s to later 30s uh would would be like like oh this guy is clearly an allegory for for gorbachev uh gorbachev um and we have two guys who are talking um in shadow while um an interview is being taken place talking about oh hey um this dom de Luis that we were trying to get he's he's gotten away but we're going to try to take care of the situation uh yada 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 and it it, it just it it tries to set these people up as being very important um but 
one of the Russian guys we never see again. Another guy who seems like he's supposed to be really uh, important. You see a handful of times not really doing anything important. And then you've got the Russian chancellor who's got two more scenes in the movie. And, and they themselves could lay the plot bare, but but you don't really get anything until we jump back to Dom DeLuise who tries to explain what's going on and, so and just makes you roll your eyes. Yeah, so, so the, the plot of this film we have it's funny that we've been talking for almost 40 minutes and we haven't actually gotten to what the plot of this movie is but because the, they don't explain what the actual plot of the film is until like minute 42 yeah that's true um <laughs> so the plot of this movie is and correct me if i'm wrong i'm gonna try to get this right um okay. there is apparently a snuff film um of of hitler and one of his closest allies who is uh, robert prosky's character um that somehow has gotten into the hands of the Steckler guy who uh, is trying to sell it to a, a porn distributor who is um, Dom DeLuise's character. Um, kind of, kind <laughs> of al- al- already. It's, uh, I feel bad correcting and being like, Oh no, actually, actually Scott, this is what it is. Cause when, <laughs> what I'm about to say just makes you go, wait, what? Um, supposedly there is a, uh, possible porn film that that is found it, it's basically think of like a celebrity sex tape except for the person who's involved in the cele- celebrity sex tape is adolf hitler and i guess uh spliced into or directly after um kind of, kind of like if you're recording something on vhs uh and then you record over something else and then it jumps into it, it i guess is what's supposed to be on this film is that somebody was filming adolf hitler adolf hitler sleeping with somebody and then interspliced after it is um adolf hitler being ritualistically um killed or assassinated, I guess, by uh, members of his uh, inner circle, one of which is uh, the Russian chancellor. Yeah, so the the whole point is that he's trying to get elected to uh, power in West Germany. He's been told before that he has Hitler ties, and he's vehemently denied them. Um, and this movie basically proves that not only did he have ties to Hitler, is he was like Hitler's best friend. And that would ruin his political career. And that's the entire thing that's happening is our good guys are trying to to get that to happen, to get the tape and expose it. And the bad guys are trying to stop them from doing that. And then at the same time, they mentioned that there may or may not be another group of people who are trying to get uh, the tape and want to make sure that it gets on the air to um, show this guy's connection. And but to further complicate things for who knows what reason, um, you have Gene Hackman and Dan Aykroyd uh, talk to a character that's played by Ronnie Cox, um, mentioning the situation that they have Dom DeLuise um, in in their stead. And he's like, well, maybe we want this to happen. Maybe we don't really want this to happen just to complicate things further, just so you can have. Of like another two chases because uh, like the way they set up the scene with um with ronnie cox just makes no sense <laughs> whatsoever what what the point is I, well, I'm, could, I'm annoyed even describing it they, they go to a russian embassy right to, to speak with people who might know what's going on and the, an fbi agent ronnie cox is there and basically tells them they need to give them what they know and get off the case because apparently exactly. he just, ha- he just happens to be there. It's not like they contacted him and said, <laughs> Hey, well, let's, let's give you a call. Like Ronnie Cox somehow finds out that they're going to show up on a whim to the Russian consulate to, to strong arm them into working with him. But at no other point has Ronnie Cox character been mentioned. No one's talked about um, having contact with anybody at the F. FBI or anything at all like he just happens to be there and be like oh hey yeah we're gonna have this conversation now yeah the, the whole the whole deciding factor of it though is that um now the FBI is after him these Russian guys are after him um the as if we haven't even named the um the fun <laughs> the fun Jewish characters that that are also after them um, oh Jesus <laughs> So the, 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 the Mossad agents? Yeah, the Israeli Secret Service. 
agents that are also after them who want the same goal as them so they immediately become the good guys and I, I don't know why we bothered to do any of that but um the whole point of this right is that now they have to the guy that they need to get the the reel from is now in new york so they have to go to new york but they have everybody after them so they get on the train to cleveland from washington dc and their plan is to get off the train in cleveland then take a flight to um, Pennsylvania, to Philadelphia, and then drive from Philadelphia to New York City. Now, I don't know if you guys know geography at all, but none of that makes any sense at all. <laughs> none of it. None, none of that makes sense because this is a movie where there's a countdown clock to, to something happening, and they're taking the most roundabout, lackadaisical way to make something happen. Why would you fly to Philadelphia? Why not fly directly to New York City? Can anybody answer this? Why take a train to no. Cleveland? No. I mean, luckily, I don't know ge- geography, so I didn't know that any of this. <laughs> okay, well, that's good. Did, 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 did somebody have points? Is, is that what it was? Somebody had miles on their card yeah, that they had to that, use? That's got to be it. Um, so th- this is the point where I can't, I have to stop talking because the train scene, I kind of stopped paying attention to everything. Um, we, we did skip over the backstory of... Um, of Dan Aykroyd's character, though, which I think is important. Um, not important to the <sighs> film itself, but important to talk about how terrible the film is. Um, because his backstory is that he, he was in narcotics, right? And he was kidnapped and brutally tortured for 48 hours by a drug lord. Um, well, well, let's... Uh... <laughs> My favorite part of this conversation is the fact that the, the um, uh, Gene Hackman, uh, whose character's name is uh, is Stern, uh, um, goes. <laughs> yeah, clearly, you that's, know, that's not, not, not on the news or anything. <laughs> um, he goes to the to to the police captain basically to say that he can't work with this guy. Um, he just can't do it. Everything that he's trying to get done is constantly. Um, being pushed to the side or or almost torn apart because of these breaks uh, that Dan Aykroyd's having. And uh, the the police captain tries to let down his guard basically by giving a giant sigh and being like, he's he's a good kid. He was a really good kid, a really sweet and smart kid. And he just always wanted to be a police officer. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to give him a uh, a chance. So... I decided to make him a police officer, which you're like, wait, I don't really think, first of all, that's how it works. And you get to make that decision. <laughs> it's, it's really nice. And, and, and he, he mentions that he decided to put him into narcotics um, and that he was a whiz. He was the greatest you'd ever seen. Um, but he ended up getting what he, uh, the police chief guy um, ends up sending Dan Aykroyd undercover right away, like on his second or third job. And, um, he was uh, kidnapped um, and tortured by Colombians, um, to which he looks at Gene Hackman and says, and you know how they are, to, which, <laughs> th- thank you, 1980s, for let's, let's just stereotype every single Colombian out there. <laughs> um, he's So you find out that he's tortured um, for 48 hours, which causes a massive uh, psychological break um, and to to which he casually says, and that's when the voices started. These little personalities, they were small at first, just one or two here or there. And then they started to crop up over time. And this is a scene where the audience is supposed to, to be made um, sympathetic to Dan Aykroyd's character. Um, I don't know about you, Scott or Matt, but uh, I did not feel sympathetic at all. Well, they play it off as a joke. I mean, this is a serious, traumatic event. Importantly, they play it off as a joke that's not funny. Um, but they, they they play this, like, again, they drop this bomb in the middle of the movie about this man went through, like, really terrible, terrible things. And now he talks like Woody the Woodpecker. And that's funny, right? Because he's going through severe mental trauma. Um, and he's not well and he needs help. But let's make jokes about it. It's it's so strange. Right. It's so weird. Well, I mean, I, I I think you could still do that if you made it like like you make the thing that happened to him be in some way comedic, right? And 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 then you're allowed to have it be comedic. Like like I can see a world where you make a comedic movie about somebody with I don't know. It'd probably be really 
tasteless, but it could actually be funny, even though tasteless. But with this, they're just like, oh yeah, he's tortured horribly. That that's why he's this way. And it's like, you know, the, the, we we said earlier the movie doesn't know what it's trying to do, so it can't have tonal whiplash. But this was tonal whiplash for me because I was like, oh, you know, it's sort of a lighthearted, you know, madcap scenario we're having, and and then we're talking about horrible torture, and it just like like it kind of makes the whole movie become depressing instantly because you're like, oh, the this isn't just a a zany comedy. This is actually a sad tragedy. Well, yeah, because then, yeah. then they move on to show his house, and it's like everything's stark white because he wants no any kind of stimulation whatsoever because mm-hmm. he's afraid this will trigger episodes. So, like, this is a portrait of, like, a really sad person. Like, this Dan Aykroyd's character, like, his whole life is so sad. He wanted to be a cop but was never good enough. His his uh, uncle, I think it was, right, finally gave him yeah. a chance, um, put him on narcotics, which if, if a guy's barely qualified to be a cop, I don't know why you put him undercover for his first assignment. That doesn't make any sense. But then he goes through this terrible, terrible trauma. It it leaves him emotionally and mentally scarred. Um, he can't live a normal life whatsoever. He spent the past two years with monks, I guess. Yep. Did, he, what, did he live at the monastery? Because he has this apartment. I, I, don't, yeah. I don't understand this whole thing, but... Um, the, the- he 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 basically lived at the mon- monastery is what they made it seem like that he's been there for the last two years and everything and um he, he has a conversation at the beginning of the film with the monk which lasts like two minutes and he's like so you think i'm ready and they're like well yeah you've you've, you've made a lot of progress in the last two years um and then at the end of that first uh, murder investigation scene he leans over to his uncle and he says thanks for this chance like he reached out to his uncle and he's like hey guess what i'm it's been two years. I'm I'm doing better, and I I really think that I can get back in the groove. What do you got? And his uncle's like, "Hey, we've got a decap uh, de- decapitation case that's right up your alley." <laughs> and, and also, after the first mental break, he should have just gone right back into treatment. Like that's that the movie should have just ended there. Is like, I'm not cured. I need more help. I need to see maybe an actual doctor and not just a monk. He oh. he should have he he should he should have been cleared by um, a, a psychiatrist that worked within the division. I mean that that's a p- major plot point that they have in all the Lethal Weapon movies is that they have uh, the psychiatrist who has to um, uh, say that Mel Gibson is fit for duty. They they make that point several different times. In this movie, they're like ah the the chief's okay with it. You know it's his nephew. There's no there's no issue whatsoever. There's there's not going to be any blowback. There's no way for us to be sued into oblivion whatsoever if this guy goes off the rails and he himself when he has a break decides to kill a whole bunch of people thankfully he doesn't have murderous tendencies he just says lines from famous movies that occasionally he does in an impression (laughs) all right uh let's let's go ahead and and skip towards the end because we're running running a little short on time um Uh, just to quickly go over things um they get on uh, the train, um, and they're going to jump through all those hoops. Um, but when they're on the train, a uh, helicopter shows up, which causes um, another break for Dan Aykroyd. Um, on the train, you've got the Mossad agent, who we haven't mentioned, uh, is played by uh, Nancy Travis. And just like everybody else in the movie, she's terrible, um, <laughs> which is basically on par for most things that Nancy Travis has done. Uh, for her career, um, <laughs> sadly true. Yeah. The they have to disembark from the train, uh, jump off a bridge. Um, Dom DeLuise attempts to make five nervous jokes that all thud um, majorly, um, and uh, we we end up at um, a bathhouse uh, that's run by Dom DeLuise's character. Um, which which we can hit very quickly because it's another one of those odd scenes that uh, doesn't really make any sense. I mean, the, the, they have a character that they're trying to look for, one of his friends from early in the movie who um, has hidden um, the, the, the film. Um, but they're on the lookout for him at this uh, bathhouse. Um, and conveniently for the people who are wandering around, he's the first person that they notice is basically uh, wearing a suit. Which uh, stands out in a bathhouse. Also, doesn't Dom DeLuise know what he looks like? So why does he send the two of them out to find him instead of just looking because through he, his two-way mirror? Have, 
<laughs> and being like, like yeah, that's him right there. Five different drinks. <laughs> of course. He, he has to go grab a drink because he's uh, uh, so apoplectic, basically, and he's he's at wit's end. Um, and they don't have any guns, so they casually ask Dom DeLuise, hey, is there any chance that you happen to have uh, any any weapons that we can use? And Dom DeLuise uh, opens um, basically a sliding glass directly behind his bar, uh, which has a huge arsenal. Uh, that would make cultists uh, uh, blush, basically. Yeah, so um, there's, there's a big shootout in the the uh, the bathhouse, right? Um, people get shot. There, there, there's a yeah, th- there's a, really a violent shootout. one. Yeah. Very, well, the, I mean, that, that's how the majority of the movie is. You've got what's supposed to be a big comedy, and any time violence shows up, it's it's very very hard. Uh, R-rated violence. Um, you've got the the head, the decapitated head at the beginning, the decapitated head uh, from the murder victim after the boat chase. Uh, a whole bunch of people get shot very, very violently. Um, you've got the the bath shootout where people are shot like four or five different times. Uh, but my favorite moment in the movie is in the bath bathhouse, which we'll we'll get to in a minute. But they go from the back bath bathhouse. Um, they try to get Dom DeLuise's friend who ends up getting shot himself, um, but is able to pass on the location of where he um, hidden has hidden the um, the film reel, which just like any other uh, buddy cop movie happens to be in a bus slash train depot. Grand Central Station, not just any bus slash train depot. But but they're all it it doesn't matter what movie we're talking about if it's if it's a buddy cop movie from the seventies or eighties if it's something like uh, Shane Black's Long Kiss Goodnight um, if it's from a movie that was probably made uh, last year um, if you've got something that somebody has hidden they have put it in a locker and whatever the biggest bus slash train depot station in that town is yep. the Bourne whatever. Yeah, that's true. Where, how do people uh, get access everything. to all these lockers at, at train depots? <laughs> they're, they're like a dollar twenty-five for an orange key. <laughs> so yeah, so the 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 film is hidden there. Um, Dan Aykroyd, in, in a moment of brilliance, sends the uh, bad guy to the exact room that the film is located. Just he sends them to a different <laughs> locker, which is not really smart. Um, and then he he finds the film, it, it, and then and then our movie ends. That's I mean, people <laughs> shoot each other. The movie ends. It, it, it's all it's all nonsensical. They're walking through Grand Central uh, Station. Um, Dan Aykroyd is talking partly in German uh, to one of the the German slash Russian slash whatever guys. Yeah, he speaks German um, now. Never established before, but. Just at that moment, and then directly turns to um, uh, Gene, Gene Hackman. Gene Hackman asks, he, he makes a comment about him uh, speaking German, and then goes, oh, oh do you speak uh, Pig Latin? And then they make sure that uh, they both speak Pig Latin and have it subtitled for the audience at home. Because <laughs> apparently, if, you, if you're if you German, there's going to be no way that you happen to know Pig Latin whatsoever. My my favorite uh, part of this scene is when Gene Hackman gets separated from Dan Aykroyd, accidentally gets on a subway leaving Grand Central Station, has to get off on a stop, <laughs> take a cab back to Grand Central, to just go right back to where he was before. It's hilarious. Like, not, and not even intentionally so. Like, why why did you write that part in it? Uh, now I'm, uh, you were, he was already there, now let's move him out just to get him back to the same spot. Ugh. Ugh. And then they have their uh, final little uh, showdown with uh, uh, the bad guy, or the the main henchman, I guess you could call him. He's not even really a bad guy. He's just the the hired gun who works for these guys who are trying to make sure that the chancellor uh, goes higher in power. Um, uh, and he and Gene Hackman have have a little standoff um, where Gene Hackman is uh, is basically using. Um, Ackroyd as a decoy being like, oh, he, he's a loose cannon. You got to watch out for him. He's he's got you in his sights. Um, 
And then magically, for no reason, the movie's like, oh, yeah, Dan Aykroyd's totally fine now. He's he's a picture of mental health uh, and he's going to kill this guy with perfect aim. But wasn't Dan Aykroyd shot in the leg at some point like an hour ago? And yes. he's he's like fine now. Yeah, he's 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 cool. Yeah. He, he, he was shot in the leg like two scenes earlier, basically. Yeah. But he's walking around fine, got in the hold of a gun and and shoots the guy uh in the chest even though he's like 10 15 feet away it it produces like a shotgun blast in the guy's chest and then has him fall end over end onto a a fruit cart that just happens to be in the middle of grand central station see and and i I would like to pretend that they did this because this is how buddy cop movies end the bad guy always falls from a, a tall thing and dies but I don't. I don't think the movie's smart enough to to like have this intentional wink or nod at that. I just think, hey, wouldn't it be cool if he falls out of this? Um, it's it's so terrible. It's so terrible. It's and <laughs> Dan Aykroyd's moment of clarity is completely unearned. Like there's no there's no moment where you see him actually get a handle on the, his issues at all. Um, but suddenly he's 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 acting like the cowardly lion or whoever he whatever voices he was making at that very end. But now he has control over them, I guess, because he's not blacking out. Yep. Any, I, I don't know. I don't know. He his voices yep. save the day, I guess. And he shoots the guy, uh. even though he could have just like materialized out of the shadows and shot him because <laughs> none, none of this makes any sense. Yeah, I, I want to go. I want to talk about the cat because the cat is a microcosm for the whole movie. <laughs> so, okay, so, so we, 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 we mentioned the cat earlier. Gene Hackman comes into the scene with the cat and then he introduces the cat as being named Camus. The existentialist philosopher, <laughs> and and then and then a bit later we see the cat is in his car in a, in a cat carrier, and then a couple of scenes later the car is completely destroyed and all of the contents of the car are like ripped out and just thrown everywhere and crushed, and we never hear anything else about the cat. That's that's true. That's that's a metaphor for everything else in the movie. Well, didn't... the cat's okay though. The cat's okay. Where did it go? Is it? Yeah, because he gives it to. Um, I'm gonna butcher her name. Um, what is it? Uh, S. Uh, Epatha uh, Merkson. Uh, she was on Law and Order for years and years and years, and she plays kind of the the police secretary. Yeah, but the, um, that conversation happens before the scene where Ackroyd sees the cat in the car and says, "Is this a cat?" Like I agree that that conversation happened. He's like, "Will you take this cat for me?" And she's like, "Yeah, I will." Yeah. But then, but then after that, the cat's back in the car in the carrier with, with their big chase scene where everything flies out of the back of the car. It's not. I'm just. I I I don't think so because he he makes the point and he leaves it with her and because that's when when she makes the weird comment about he he says he's having a bad day uh, and wants her to say something nice about him. And uh, she says that he looks like he has surprisingly strong thighs for a white man. Um, <laughs> and, and then and then she agrees to, to to watch the cat. Uh, yeah, I, I seem to remember being in the car right before that chase scene, but maybe not. Maybe you're right. I don't know. We can't. There was, there was cat food in there. There were about eight, nine bags of cat food in the car. <laughs> yeah. So okay. I don't. Uh, th- this movie makes me angry. So this so this is the end. Um, everyone's happy now. Um, Dan Aykroyd is cured. Maybe they never really say whether like there's a scene where he's acting goofy in the kids' uh, hospital room where yeah. you're supposed to say like, "Oh no, he's having a break again." But no, it just turns out he's just entertaining kids. So to me, that's like, "Oh look, he has a handle on his issue now." I guess. I don't. I... This movie is horseshit. <laughs> It's, it is. It's so terrible. <laughs> it's so bad. It, it doesn't care. Like, I, I, I could understand if, like, if it was a bad uh, movie and was funny because of its incompetence or the issues uh, th- that it has. I, I could, I could give it a pass. If it was so bad, it was funny. I, I could be more on its side. I could suggest it to people. But the fact that. Everything in the movie is trying so hard. Everything in the movie thinks 
it, 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 there's a weird push because I can't even really say that the movie feels like it's great because there's point points where it feels like a little piece of dialogue or a little set piece that it has it's proud of. But then at the same time, two seconds later, the movie's like, I we we don't really care about this scene. We just we just need to get this done and on time. And and that's a that's a horrible thing to have in a movie. If the mm-hmm. movie just seems uh, generally like it doesn't care about the characters, if it doesn't care about the instances that are that are taking place, then then you at the audience are going to be more uh, taken out of it. Because if if the movie can't uh, can't try to be competent, then why should you meet it halfway? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and my biggest like we said before, this is a rated R movie. Who who is this movie yeah. for? Because it's a rated R movie with tons of terrible violence in it, but the central conceit of the film is Dan Aykroyd doing goofy voices. Who who was the target audience of this movie? I mean, obviously they they failed to reach whoever their target audience was because the movie bombed horribly and made no money. But when they sat down to say who do we want to go see this movie, I mean, the central plot line centers around. Isn't Dan Aykroyd funny when he uses his silly voices? And that seems like something that we're aiming for children. But then we make it a rated R movie. Like, you could easily do this as, like, a PG, PG PG-13 film. Um, Mm -hmm. You could easily do it. You just take out all the completely unnecessary gratuitous violence. You take out some of the bad words. Like, that's the weirdest part is these guys cuss like crazy, but they also say words like poo-poo. Or he calls he calls him he says doo doo once like mm-hmm. it, it's it's this really weird weird dichotomy between these two things and that's that's why it fails because it doesn't know what it wants to be it doesn't know who it wants to be for it doesn't know what its point is it doesn't it doesn't bother doing anything it was just it was just buddy yeah. cop films are 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 big right now we got some big name actors in it so uh, one of them happens to be a comedian so we had to make it funny. Um, and of course well, they, they, they they wanted to push Dan Aykroyd. They wanted to feature him in lots of movies because he he has this weird run of of failures where he played either leads or major parts. That goes from uh, the Couch Trip, which also has him play somebody who's had a psychotic break and is nuts. Yeah. Uh, Caddyshack Two, um, My Stepmother is an Alien. Uh, this loose cannons, uh, nothing but trouble, and then Ghostbusters Two is in there, and and that's that's a spat of time from like 1987 to 1992, where he's at the forefront uh, of these movies, and they're just trying to push him on to everybody, basically. And it seemed like they were trying to uh, to get all their bases of either ex- movies that are perfectly defined as comedies even if they're not funny and then movies that kind of skirt the edge of this is an action comedy this is a sci-fi comedy uh but but still trying to tailor it and push him out there to make him um a star and it's weird that you can't really think of lots of people in that in that period that look like uh dan Aykroyd or had his skill set that continually were being given these chances yeah that's true (sighs) <sighs> all right well, that's that's the movie know. that's the, the end of the film <laughs> hooray <laughs> that that's that's not the end of the film actually because uh uh if, if you're somebody who starts the beginning of the credits you might be lulled into uh some weird confusing trance by uh the theme song of uh, uh the movie uh which is called loose cannons as well and is sung by uh katie seagal who everybody knows from uh, Married with Children, Futurama, Sons of Anarchy. Uh, She sings the song, which features a weird, screechy Dan Aykroyd singing a refrain. Um, And it turns out that this is an all Aykroyd affair because Peter Aykroyd, Dan Aykroyd's brother, actually wrote the song. What is this movie? (laughs) I don't. The song I, is terrible. I I, I, it, I turned it off before that happened because I'm not insane like you are. <laughs> but um, you sent me a link to it, and oh my god, oh my we god. we will we will definitely have it be the the, the exit music to this it, episode because be. yeah, it, it it it's an earworm that you will curse us uh, for. <laughs> uh, the, the movie's riddled with such weird little bits i mean we've talked about all the things that don't make sense in the movie but then there's a ton a ton 
of uh, character actors that are that are just strewn throughout uh, the movies. We already mentioned um, Asopatha Merkson, uh, who plays the uh, the police secretary, basically. Um, you've got Reg E. Uh, Carthy, who most people um, know from um, uh, House of Cards. Um, mm-hmm. He plays uh, the guy who who ran the rib joint. Uh, David Allen Greer is in it for like 30, 30 seconds to two minutes at the beginning of the movie. Uh, one of the uh, the guys who works for Vaughn Metz, the guy who's in the, the snuff film, uh, is played by a very young uh, Tobin Bell, who most people know as uh, the, the lead antagonist in the in the Saw film series, or hero, I guess, if you're weird. Um, <laughs> Leon Rippey um, plays Westcott, um, the, the cop that's in like two scenes that you think is going to be um, big and never shows back up. Uh, the bouncer at the S&M club um, is played by the guy who voices Patrick Starr from SpongeBob SquarePants and is also known as uh, Dauber from the Coach TV show. Um, and then you've also got, oh God, who am I uh, blanking on? There was uh, another big person. But just throughout the movie, they've got all these uh, character actors that you think are going to have uh, bigger parts in the film, but it, it doesn't add up to anything. Oh, Ronnie Cox. Ronnie Cox, who is the FBI agent. And everybody knows Ronnie Cox is everybody's favorite old uh a uh, bad guy from uh, Total Recall and RoboCop. And it's got all these people who you think could add to the quality uh, of the film, but do absolutely nothing. How did they trick these people into being in this movie? Because I can't uh, it, imagine someone read a script and said, yes. It, it's called money, Scott. <laughs> Please, please explain. What is this this money in which you speak? <laughs> uh, money, money and clouds. They give you money so that you you appear in these products, regardless of quality. And then they say that they're going to give you something uh, better uh, in the future. Um, I know this is a horrible thing to ask, uh, but is there any ray of sunshines for you guys? Is there anything in the movie that stood out that you would quantify as uh, an approximation of good? I have one because it's the only time I laughed watching this movie. Okay. Um, we didn't we didn't necessarily talk about the scene, but there's your typical um, at night scene, like the low point of the movie when the two characters have um, the three characters, uh, Ackroyd and uh, Hackman and, and Dom DeLuise are out in the wilderness at night after jumping off the train, and uh, Hackman's trying to pump up um, Dan Ackroyd. Um, who feels terrible about the fact that he is mentally disordered. <laughs> and um, he gives him some speech about how he's just fighting against the light, which really doesn't make any sense at all in context of the film or anything. <laughs> like, that speech doesn't make sense. It doesn't fit anything that they're trying to do at all. But the point is they end up, like, howling to the sky in the scene. And uh, at point of it, uh, Dom DeLuise is kind of just in the background sleeping. And then as they're howling, it cuts to him... He looks up, sees the two of them just howling randomly, and just goes, "Ha, huh, shit!" And then just falls back asleep. And that, <laughs> I laughed out loud at that point because that's exactly how I felt watching that scene and watching that entire movie. It's just I can't. This is awful. I just need to go to go away. Yeah, I, I laughed out loud at that too. That was the only other point where I, where I actually thought it was. Uh, c- correct comedic timing and like an actual joke yeah. had been had been pulled off. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I'm fond of like uh, schlocky action violence, so I actually liked the ridiculous like, um, you know, '80s explicit uh, shooting scenes with lots of squibs and <laughs> and practical effects, and the one point where somebody fires like a tiny little rocket from a shoulder mounted bazooka and it like blows up like five cars and most of a building um and just this enormous fireball that was clearly it, it yeah it, basically i i love that because it's so bad but there was nothing actually good about this movie and and actually overall i think this movie was mostly bad in boring ways <laughs> uh, unlike the happening from last month which was bad in in like hilarious ways where yeah. you you sort of do enjoy watching it because you're just like how the 
<laughs> what? Uh, but this this movie, you're just like, uh, and, and really like the story surrounding how the movie was made is funnier and more interesting than the movie itself. That is true. I think. Well, we we've got we've got two tidbits of that. Scott has one um, tidbit on on uh, story surrounding the movie, and I've got one more uh, piece of background information that I hope sends us on a uh, a wild goose chase. But for for my uh, Ray of Sunshine is also kind of a, a shadow of hell, if if you will, because it's one of the few um, what the fuck moments of the movie that you don't know why they kept it in. But in in the bat uh, bathhouse shootout, uh, they they've got the the classic um, action staple of everything going slow motion for a second. But in this movie, for whatever reason, they have a slow motion close-up shot of gene hackman when he's firing his gun is shooting at a blank window (laughs) there's there's no bad guys around the window there's bad guys on either side of the window but when it slows down and it has a slow down close-up of him firing his gun into a window hitting no one whatsoever (laughs) that's just laziness that's someone they took some takes and someone looked back the takes and was like uh, this doesn't really work. Eh, just keep it in. It's fine. I don't want to reshoot it. Uh, but, exactly but I, but I think it, 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 yeah, but, but it, it typifies the entire movie yeah. is that people are like, Oh, we've got a script. We've, uh, let's just try to get it done. Let's just try to get it done. Um, but, uh, Scott hit us with, uh, the piece of, uh, information that you found out about this film. Yeah, so the only interesting thing I think is about this film is its legacy. And <laughs> its legacy is um, in, in 2013, I think it was, um, someone was going through a dump in Canada and found a damaged uh, piece of, of film from this movie. It's a scene from the beginning of the movie where Dan Aykroyd is standing over a corpse of one of the people murdered at the beginning of the film. And it's heavily damaged. It's it's really unclear, but you can also very clearly see it's Dan Aykroyd. Um, but someone saw this, got freaked out, thought it was a real murder, and a police investigation was opened um, to to try to figure out um, what was going on here. Which, of course, eventually led back to Dan Aykroyd because his face is on in the frame very clearly. Um, obviously, nothing happened of it because they were like, "No, this is just a bad movie from uh, twenty three years ago." But Dan Aykroyd said uh, it, it, it belongs in the dump where it was found. So I don't think he's very fond of this, this movie either. But that, that to me, that story right there is far more interesting than anything we watched in this movie. Oh, yeah. And uh, another piece that I found out from uh, surrounding the making of the movie was that uh, J.T. Walsh, who's a very, very famous character actor uh, from years past, Look him up on IMDb if you don't know who he is, because he's been in everything. If you see his face, you will say, oh, that guy. Uh, but he was hired on to be uh, the main henchman goon who's running after uh, Hackman, DeLuise, and Aykroyd through the entire film. But he was actually fired after two days by uh uh, by Dan Aykroyd because he was in a movie in uh, 1987 called Wired. Wired was a uh, a big uh, sens- a sens- uh, sorry uh, centralized uh, biography of uh, John Belushi, who of course was a big friend of Dan Aykroyd. Uh, and in the movie, John Belushi directly after his death uh, wakes up in the morgue. Um, and as he's about to have the autopsy done, um, on him, he runs off to retrace the steps of his life to find out what brought him to this point. And JT Walsh plays, uh, Bob Woodward of Woodward and Bernstein, of course, from all the president's men and, and numerous other, uh, true crime, uh, books, um, looking through all of Belushi's, uh, files at his house, getting ready to write a book on him. And they end up crossing paths at the end of the movie uh, and have an interview. Um, Michael Chiklis plays Belushi in the film um, and was chosen from like 200 different people and has actually apologized to both Jim Belushi and um, Dan Aykroyd for his performance and involvement of the film. Uh, But this movie wired Dan Aykroyd hired a coven of witches to put a curse on the movie so that it wouldn't be a financial success. Um, 
so that's the type of person that that you have acting in this movie who wrote this, this movie fired somebody because he was in this other film uh who I, I don't that that's the person who who's in loose cannons that that's your your acting hero adrian did the curse work i uh on wired yes um but but i think it's kind of one of those monkey paw things where it's uh um you can make your wish but then you have to uh, suffer whatever consequences come with it so whatever curse was put on wired i would definitely say uh, kicked back onto uh, loose cannons um, because not only at the time did it not make any money. It, it's a movie that cost $15 million to make. Uh, it made back $5 million of it at the box office. Two and a half million dollars of that was weekend one. So no one wanted to see this movie. You can go on to Rotten Tomatoes today and see that loose cannons has a 0% fresh rating. <laughs> Yep. Well, I think that <laughs> that says it all right there. <laughs> uh, I, I think that, that this actually is gonna... what? That, that actually surprises me a little bit because when I went to rent it on Amazon to pay my hard-earned dollars to watch this movie, um, it it had like four and a half stars out of five. I've, so uh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's not critics. That's normal people. They can't be trusted. <laughs> I, IMDb has like a 4.7 and like 600 and, uh, 605 uh, reviewers on there. So, um, yeah. yeah. My, my, that, favorite, that should... my favorite review is not that bad. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> but then they gave uh, it a well, 6 this out is going to bring us. What? I should, uh... <laughs> yeah. ne- never, never question the logic of the public. Yeah, um, that's true. Well, this is going to bring us to the judgment, which I think is going to be rather unanimous and simple. Uh, I'm going to start with Scott. Do you vote guilty or not guilty? You know, we talked uh, a couple weeks ago, I think it was, and I said I am a proponent of never hating a movie, and you said that you're going to make me hate a movie. I don't hate this movie. I want that to be very clear. But I also try as I, I, and I, I really tried, I really tried to find some redeeming factor in this film, um, and I could not find it. Like, the the scene that I mentioned is literally the only moment that it approaches comedy. Um, it's still incompetently directed, terribly acted, horribly written. Um, I, I, this, this, this movie is guilty of crimes against cinema, without a doubt. All right. Matt, on to you. Guilty or not guilty? Sorry about that. Yes, uh, th- this is a boring, bad lazy movie guilty <laughs> <laughs> there was a really dramatic pause there that, that was more yeah. dramatic than anything that happened in this film oh yeah burn. well well it, it's it, really like if you're if you if you want just go to the wikipedia page for this movie read about the background read about how crazy dan Aykroyd is in fact just spend an afternoon Going down that rabbit hole, that will be far more entertaining than watching this movie. Don't watch this movie. <laughs> but I hear, I hear his vodka is pretty good. Yeah, it's, it's true. Skull it's vodka, crystal skull vodka, or, or tequila, <laughs> or whatever tequila it was. Or is it vodka? I don't remember. I know it was in a crystal skull. Of course, it was because 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 aliens. Because it's damn. No, be, because a, yeah, because of aliens and ghosts. Uh, if you don't know what we're talking about, just look on. Just in in Google, put Dan Aykroyd plus, plus aliens plus ghosts, and uh, lose the next four or five hours or or a couple days. Uh, there's yeah. hours and hours of I videos mean, that you can find. He's he's really not playing a character in Ghostbusters. No, no, he's just being himself in Ghostbusters. <laughs> This this episode um, of Phantom Zone is brought to you by Crystal Head Vodka. <laughs> if only I'll I'll plug it if we get free stuff. I, I would love probably. to. Yeah. Give me some um, free vodka. Yeah, sure. Um, okay, I'm I'm going to say guilty, obviously. <laughs> um, so th- this this movie we're two for two so far, uh, launching it into the Phantom Zone. Uh, this is a far. Are far worse movie uh, than The Happening. All I can really say about this one is if you want to get a feel of this movie, um, check our links that we have. Um, you're you're going to hear 
uh, the, the song that we're talking about at the very end. Uh, but then there is uh, an, an, a small little scene from the movie that that's the, the beginning of the investigation scene uh, that does show the randomly decapitated uh, body and just the tone and feel of the, the minute and a half that they have on there says uh, everything. everything. Um, I- for, for next month, well, well, I'm 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 going to be nice to you guys. I'm going to tell you now that I'm going to be nice and I'm going to take pity on you. Um, and the movie that we're going to do for next month, it, it's a terrible film, but it's far more entertaining uh, than than this movie. Um, it's a movie that there's a chance that I am probably going to be arguing that we not sent it into the Phantom Zone because it is so bad and so horrible that it is absolutely hilarious. Uh, it, it's a new movie. It's a movie that came out this year straight to to direct a video. Uh, I am Wrath, starring John Travolta. I am so excited. I am excited. That was a, that was a joke. No one's laughing. You, you should be excited. This the it, it, the movie is a treat. I I cannot recommend it more highly. Well, you know, I got to say, Adrian, I, I regretted saying guilty on the happening. And I regret it even more knowing how much worse this movie is. I, I wish I could undo the happening, but it still, it still probably would have been convicted even with my not guilty vote. <laughs> um, but you, you, sir, are destroying my life once a month <laughs> with these movies. These are, <laughs> you're, you are finding truly terrible works of art, in quotation marks, to, to make us watch. So w- well done. <laughs> I, I I try to do my part. Um, okay, to to wrap things up today, um, Scott, where can we find you on the internet? I am on Twitter uh, at scottdaily85. That's D A L Y, and uh, you can find some of my writing at dailyplanetfilms.com. Um, I wrote a piece about Hamilton last week uh, that turned out pretty good. And I'm pretty proud of it, so you can check that out. Uh, I love Hamilton, by the way. If you didn't if you didn't know that, I, I love Hamilton. <laughs> well, you, I I've never heard of somebody who who loves Hamilton. And that's new to me. <laughs> okay, Matt, where can we find you? I am on Twitter at more than a mail, and I'm currently working on a piece for dailyplanetfilms.com um, um, about that new travesty, the Little Prince from Netflix. <laughs> Is it bad? I, I can't wait to I can't wait to read this. I'm so excited. And I have problems. I have problems with it. Ah. So the, well, th- th- this is only the like fiftieth variation of the Little Prince, so yeah, I'm not, I I'm not sure. Well, <laughs> well, I'll be excited to to read about it. Um, you can find me on Twitter at Yo Adrian Torres. Uh, I decided to change my Twitter because I was uh, getting sick of trying to um, explain what my Twitter handle meant and then um, spelling it out for people. Uh, while they slowly fell asleep, so I decided to em- embrace uh, my my partial namesake. Um, hey Matt, did you and... know you could do that? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, now I now I do, but I feel like I'm I feel like I'm locked into my in, unpronounceable string of letters now. So I don't know. Hey, hey, if you can rock it, you should rock it. Yeah, yeah, I. I actually think of something better, and if I had thought of something better by now, then I would have switched aliases long ago. So, <laughs> Adrian, was that a Rocky joke that you just made? God, yeah, slightly, of course. I'm gonna, I'm gonna to torture you for this this Twitter name. I just want you to know, Constant. I, it's Scott. Constant. J- just to let you know, I'm I'm 33 years old. Um, from basically the day I was born, everybody's been making the joke. So well, I'm. That, that's but, what that's, your parents get. <laughs> that that that's why I'm deciding to embrace it. You gotta you gotta do it. I made the comment earlier today that um, on my headstone I'll probably say yes, Adrian, like Rocky. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you guys. I I, I think we've uh, tortured everyone enough uh, uh, discussing this film. Um, so that I I look forward to the next go around. As long as you guys come back. I, I wish we could finish these things with like me taking a copy of the Loose Cannons DVD case and like flinging it into oblivion. And by oblivion, <laughs> I mean off of my balcony into the street. Yeah. That, that's that, that's 
that's not dramatic enough. I wish that we <laughs> lived like near like near the Grand Canyon and had like a mini catapult that we could launch a VHS or, or, or DVD copy into it. We might get arrested every single time we did it, but it would be worth it. It would be worth it. Nobody watch this movie, please. <laughs> Okay, everybody, we now uh, leave you with the terrible, awful, horrible theme to Loose Cannons.